John Oliver was biting during his HBO season finale last night on how dissecting President Donald Trump's words can underscore his incoherence and only prompt futility for the media and other outsiders. Knock on wood, that's not quite the same with the more than 13.4 million documents constituting the Paradise Papers, namely the latest tale of the elite's tax evasion as detailed by 380 journalists form 96 organizations. On a chilly Chicago soccer field Sunday morning, a young tech executive asked me about them and why disclosure of tax havens used by Apple, Queen Elizabeth, Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross, Bono and others made much of a difference. It's all mostly legal, right? For sure legal if unseemly in the premeditated complexity and confusion by those who benefit from them. And, for sure, connections between the tax avoidance and real-world concerns can be hard to understand. So it's fortunate that a fabulous story broke in days after the initial, synchronized release of stories on November 5th eliminates any confusion or incoherence and makes such a connection better than some of the initially wondery reported tales overseen by the Washington-based Consortium of Investigative Journalists. Indeed, development dreams stand still while mining money moves offshore as by the consortium's own Will Fitzgibbon, who runs its Africa desk and traveled to the tiny landlocked West African nation Burkina Faso that includes a zinc mine owned by Nanta Mining SA, a subsidiary of the Swiss commodity giant Glencore PLC. This exhibits a tie between tax avoidance and locals getting shafted, namely a zinc mine taking advantage of offshore tax havens while both its workers and neighbors suffer awful poverty and environmental degradation. In some details from leaked Glencore records reveal a story of contrasts. As villagers struggled with hunger, poverty and other hardships, boardroom machinations in faraway Switzerland, Bermuda and other tax havens moved millions of dollars into, and then out of, the small African nation whose name means land of honest men. The details are revealed in files, containing multi-million dollar sales contracts, board of directors decisions, budgets and emails, from the blue-chip Bermuda law firm Appleby. The files document its relationship with the mining company's parent, Glencore, one of the world's largest metals, oil and grain traders. The documents are among the more than 11,000 million analyzed by the consortium, such citing in 94 media partners, including the New York Times, Guardian and Vice, which reveal how Glencore made secret payments, battled cash-strapped countries in court, and sought to reduce its tax bill in nations around the world. Along the way, the consortium separated discovered a confidential assessment by Burkina Faso's tax office that accused is the Glencore subsidiary of abusing tax loopholes and creating fictitious charges by shell companies to reduce taxable earnings and avoid paying tens of millions of dollars in taxes to one of the world's poorest countries. Glencore denies improprieties but this a damning window onto the nexus of avoidance and related injustice, in particular how it involves workers seen by some as de facto slaves which the company denies at the country's biggest zinc mine warehousing built for workers lies largely empty and abandoned, while a foundation meant to distribute money for social development has fallen way short. As Mike Hudson, senior editor of the consortium, put it Sunday, we've struggled to do these kinds of on-the-ground impact stories throughout our offshore leaks investigations, because the harms caused by offshore secrecy and chicanery are, while real and potent, usually indirect fewer tax dollars for governments means less money for schools and hospitals, etc. The elaborate layering of offshore tax and secrecy structures often means there are many layers of insulation between questionable activities and their ultimate effects on real people. New editor at Vanity Fair the word got out that Radika Jones, now a New York Times book editor and a former editor at Time, will succeed Graydon Carter as editor of Vanity Fair which includes The Hive. At first blush, it is like a smart choice. Michael Duffy, the longtime estimable reporter and editor at Time who recently left the magazine, worked with her daily and said, she's gonna be great. Radika is a curious, engaging and yet tough-minded editor with great range and skill as well as a keen sense of fun. VF and its readers are in for her treat. Dean Baquet, editor of The Times, says, she is one of the broadest editors around. She knows books, art and politics. And she is a wonderful colleague. It was a smart hire. Think, too, of what this says about the bench strength of The Times, and the lack of same at nearly all American newspapers. Vanity Fair plucks a talent from the book section, who's probably not especially well known among a lot of the rank and file. Oh, yeah, a real book section remember when even major regional papers had won. Great reporting The New York Times opens with an amazing anecdote of a cybersecurity consultant, Jake Williams, who looked at a tweet during an Orlando training session and realized had been outed as a former ACE National Security Agency or part of its tailored access operations. Scott Shane, Nicole Pearl Roth and David Sanger disclose how that revelation was part of a much broader earthquake that has shaken the NSA to its core. 
Current and former agency officials say the shadow broker's disclosures, which began in August 2016, have been catastrophic for the NSA, calling into question its ability to protect potent cyber weapons and its very value to national security. The agency regarded as the world's leader in breaking into adversaries' computer networks failed to protect its own. The jolt to Mr. Williams from the shadow broker's repost was part of a much broader earthquake that has shaken the NSA to its core. Current and former agency officials say the shadow broker's disclosures, which began in August 2016, have been catastrophic for the NSA, calling into question its ability to protect potent cyber weapons and its very value to national security. The agency regarded as the world's leader in breaking into adversaries' computer networks failed to protect its own. Point six zero minutes and gymnasts had interviewed star U.S. Olympics gymnast Ali Raisman, who alleged UAL abuse by Dr. Larry Nasser, former USA gymnastics doctor. The key work on this whole topic in recent years, especially in revealing the odious actions of Nasser, has been by the USA Today Network and the Indianapolis Star. As the accurate boilerplate of their stories notes the abuse did not become public until two former gymnasts told the Indianapolis Star last year that they were abused by Nasser during the 1990s and early 2000s. They said he molested them during multiple treatments. The Indianapolis Star is part of the USA Today Network, according to the Lansing State Journal, also part of the USA Today Network. More than 140 women and girls have since said Nasser really abused them, with nearly all of them saying it happened during medical appointments. Headline of the day Mueller immediately closed his investigation after hearing Putin proclaim his innocence thanks, the Barowitz report closed second from GQ Keurig pulled its ads from Hannity and now his fans are trying to boycott bad coffee morning Babel Trump friends heralded their guy talking trade in Manila while co-hosts Brian Kilmeade and Ainsley Earhart pushed their own new books, including a look at their book tour appearance in Jacksonville, Florida. As for Trump, there was his so-called breakout with the Australian leader, a chance to focus on trade deals and market access for American products. And there was with Rodrigo Duterte, the murderous, anti-drugs zealot Philippines leader. Roy Moore that was a favorite topic at CNN's New Day, as it offered the problematic vision of Moore having to sit down for a deposition in a potential lawsuit of which there is no certainty. Meanwhile, Trump's Vladimir Putin comments over the weekend were the talk of Morning Joe with Mika Brzezinski and Joe Scarborough away. Substitutes Nicole Wallace John Heilman were very good, even as he walked those back and apparently now playing nice with the intelligence community is currently constituted. And now there's word that Breitbart sent reporters to probe Moore's accusers, as Axios lays out. There's ample coverage of Moore, too, in the primary Birmingham, Alabama website, including a quiet morning at the church he's not attended the last few weeks. CNN's Fit Bloomberg's Jonah Chera looks at the Department of Justice fumbling over the proposed a Time Warner merger, with rumors swirling about Justice Department pressure to unload CNN. Trump's already tainted U.S. antitrust lawyers, however the Justice Department rules on the a Time Warner deal, the reek of politics will linger. Chris Wallace on Journalism The International Center for Journalists gave an award to Fox Chris Wallace, with the Washington stalwart making the case, I believe that some of our colleagues many of our colleagues think this president has gone so far over the line to bash the media it has given them an excuse to cross the line themselves, to push back. And as tempting as that may be, I think it's a big mistake. That doesn't mean we're stenographers. If the president or anyone we're covering says something untrue or does something clearly over the line, we can and should report that, Wallace said. But we should NT be drawn into becoming players on the field, trying to match the people we cover in invective. It's not our role. We're not as good at it as they are. And we're giving up our special place in our democracy. There's enough to report about this president that we don't need to offer opinions or put our thumb on the scale. Be as straight and accurate and dispassionate as we first learned to be as reporters. Embattled Goodell seeks a $50 million salary ESPN somewhat buried its own Latin morning exclusive on its website not on air Sunday NFL reporters Adam Schefter and Chris Mortensen reported on negotiations over a new contract for NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell, who heads one of the most profitable of antitrust-exempt nonprofits. The committee will address Goodell's salary and compensation package. The last written counterproposal from Goodell, which was around the 1st of August, was seeking about $49.5 million per year, as well as the lifetime use of a private jet and lifetime health insurance for his family, according to a source familiar with the negotiations. 
Francis Fitzgerald on Ken Burns reviewing the Ken Burns Linovic Vietnam War series on PBS which will re-air through November 28 and the New York Review of Books, journalist author Francis Fitzgerald writes for those under 40, for whom the Vietnam War seems as distant as World War I or II, the film will serve as an education for those who lived through it, the film will serve as a reminder of its horrors and of the official lies that drove it forward. In many ways it is hard. Two, and its battle scenes will revive the worst nightmares of those who witnessed them firsthand. For those under 40, for whom the Vietnam War seems as distant as World War I or II, the film will serve as an education for those who lived through it, the film will serve as a reminder of its horrors and of the official lies that drove it forward. In many ways it is hard to, and its battle scenes will revive the worst nightmares of those who witnessed them firsthand. Group thinks sports writers should be barred from listening to one another before making predictions or to local sports radio. The boosterish conventional wisdom in Chicago all week was that the truly awful Bears, their offense is only slightly superior to that of the high school, any high school, nearest you, would upend for the first time in ages in Chicago the injury-riddled but inherently superior Green Bay Packers. All seven Chicago Tribune sports writers who made predictions in Sunday's paper said the Bears would win. At the Sun-Times, four of five predicted the Bears. Only columnist Rick Morrissey went with the Packers, 17-14, the Packers won, 2,316, P.T. Barnum's political past. If your mother says she loves you, check it out. I reported on a Chicago appearance by Kevin Young, poetry editor of The New Yorker, who's written a book on bunk, hoaxes and fake news, in part tying the American tradition to pernicious notions of race. In comparing of P.T. Barnum and Trump, he said Barnum had run unsuccessfully for office. Thanks to reader Ellen Sandhaus, for correcting us Barnum was elected mayor of Bridgeport, Connecticut in 1875 and had previously served in the state legislature. The Limits of the Arab Spring John Evans, a novelist, journalist, software engineer, writes in TechCrunch Remember the Arab Spring Revolution 2.0 Remember how we imagined, of triumphal optimism, that social media would become the web that knit the oppressed masses better, would empower them to join together and overthrow their oppressors and stride shoulder to shoulder together into a better world. Yeah, those were the days. But now, disillusioned hardly begins to describe it. I write to you from Tunisia, the Arab Springs poster child, now a secular democracy but even here, in this lovely country of hospitable people, whose downtown hipsters and students thronging the Carthage Film Festival could be teleported to Brooklyn or the Mission and not look one whit out of place, today's headlines inform me that the nationwide state of emergency has been extended yet again. A book for economics writer Sense and Sensibility, a book by Gary Saul Morrison and Morton Shapiro of Northwestern University the latter is the president there and an economist, got a nice Sunday review in the Washington Post that economics writers might check out. As the review notes, value investing is an approach, not a prescription, and a lot of nuances is missed by economists. The two men, who outlined their thesis at a Chicago Humanities Festival event Sunday, do not exactly say that mathematics ruined economics, but they think it, wrote the Post. They want economists to talk to people in the humanities. They think public policy could he improved by Tolstoy, infused with an ethical sensibility. As Morrison put it Sunday, you can't mathematicize culture, his point being that that will only get you so far in understanding different societies. You're better off reading great literature, especially to understand the complexities of human motivation that can impact economic policies. They both noted one recent study in which the majority of economists surveyed said they had nothing to learn from other fields to assist them in their work. If those who said there were fields that provided insight, the one they pointed to the most was finance, which is pretty much the same thing as economics, a droll and disbelieving Shapiro noted. Smaller than a footnote is for the president's trek to Manila with reference to his talking to reporters, or a gaggle, on Air Force One, the New York Times' Mark Lendler informed colleagues passing along an addendum from Saturday's Pooler Ashley Parker, in response to some questions Air Force One took noticeably longer than scheduled to fly between Da Nang and Hanoi. Here's what happened. President Trump arrived at the airport in Da Nang ahead of schedule, meaning he was going to be early for the formal arrival ceremony in Hanoi, for which people had traveled for hours to participate in. The White House needed to delay their arrival, so the Air Force One took off but then flew about an hour to south of Da Nang, before turning around and heading back up to Hanoi, to kill time. This led to a highly amusing, if confusing, in-flight map of our route. Also, during the president's gaggle on the flight, even as Trump was making news on Russia, Sarah Huckabee Sanders was outwardly calm and never tried to cut him if and the gaggle changed the topic. The stoicism and patience of Sanders is hereby commended with the deepest gratitude.
Liz Smith, Robert McFadden, 80 and now a senior writer on the New York Times obituary desk, is the byline on its Liz Smith obituary. Liz Smith, the longtime queen of New York's tabloid gossip columns, who for more than three decades chronicled little triumphs and tresses in the soap opera lives of the rich, the famous and the merely beautiful, died on Sunday at her home in Manhattan. She was 94, from hard scrabble nights writing snippets for a Hearst newspaper in the 1950s to golden afternoons at Le Cirque with Sinatra or Hepburn and to tea tape dinners with Madonna to gather material for columns that ran six days a week, Miss Smith captivated millions with her tattletale chit-chat and, over time, ascended to fame and wealth that rivaled those of the celebrities she covered. A self-effacing, good-natured, vivacious Texan who professed to be awed by celebrities, Miss Smith was the antithesis of the brutal columnist J.J. Hunsecker and Clifford Oditz and Ernest Lehman's screenplay for Sweet Smell of Success, which portrayed sinister power games in a seamy world of press agents and nightclubs. Corrections tips Please email me jawaran at pointer.org. Would you like to get this roundup emailed to you every morning? Sign up here.